Cause she walks down to the house on the corner Where Jesus lives among the least of those who gather there It's a house he started building when he first saw the dove God bless the house that Jesus built A house he built with love People who were around this area in 1850, a very rural community, decided they needed a church structure. There were churches nearby, but distances then, not like they are today, caused us some problems in getting to, to the local congregation. So they decided to build a church here. A Burr and Emsley Glasscock on the land, uh, what is now the intersection of Smoketown and uh, Minneville Road. At that time, it was the intersection of Smoketown Road and Davis Ford Road. Smoketown dead in it, right? Uh, at Davis Ford. And all the property across the, the road there belonged to the Glasscocks. Uh, they donated six tenths of an acre. And so let's build a congregation, build a church. Uh, and so they, along with others in Greenville, did so. And we we're standing in that structure that they put together in 1850. Mr. Glasscock himself was an interesting man. He was a lay preacher in the Methodist Church, and that is to be accurate about it. The Methodist Episcopal Church South. And so this congregation from its beginning was historically a Methodist congregation. And as the lay speaker, he would sometimes preach sermons. Uh, also, uh, most importantly, he would visit the congregation um, on a monthly basis, and part of his visit was to gather the offering. They didn't have to take offerings during the services because he went, made the rounds of household to household and collected the, um, the offerings that uh, were needed to sustain the church. When the Civil War came along, this was an ideal location for, lo for those who had been injured in the two battles in Bull Run. Uh, they turned it into a hospital. George Hedges told me some interesting stories he'd heard, heard from his family. Um, including the fact that it was great excitement when the hospital was here in the church building um, because the children would gather across the road. There's a Sunoco station there now. We want to pinpoint the area, and there was a slight hill, so they were elevated a little bit higher than the church building. And they would stand there and watch the activities taking place inside the building. A little bit gruesome to say it, but you understand the times. A lot of what they saw were body parts being tossed at the windows because of amputations that took place. And he said the kids just were fascinated by that, as you can imagine. After the Civil War, the church structure was not in the best of condition after it had been used in that fashion, so the people had to rebuild it. Sometime a few years later, there was a fire, as I understand it, took place here, and that caused more construction to be necessary. But always the church stayed, and always the church continued, and the people came here. Um, and even though it was a Methodist congregation of one sort or another all the time, there was one part of it that always has always intrigued me, since it was the only structure of any size, and granted it wasn't very big, but of any size at all in this general community, uh, and the only church, people came from various denominations to worship here from the beginning, and still do. So it's a Methodist congregation, but probably everybody from every other denomination you think of has been a part of its history. Uh, and secondly, because of the nature of the structure, people came here for meetings. Uh, political rallies were held here. Um, they would, uh, people in the church would have them dinners, chicken prepared primarily uh, from the guests and people would come and they would set up a wagon and put straw in the back of the wagon and the various politicians would take turns standing up and giving their speeches. Um, that was how politics was played so many years ago. Um, also 4-H was here and the sewing club and goodness knows anything that the community wanted or needed. Um, people could gather here and use this, this building. So it was an important focal point for the community when there was no other focal point available and that emphasis has continued to today. We still open the doors to lots and lots of organizations and groups who like to participate and need space uh, here. Um, the church uh, kind of just went along in a normal fashion in a, a small church in a rural community in the 1920s. And then, then kind of an explosion of activity that, that took place under the leadership of a pastor named Shoemaker. Um, and the United Methodist Women's Group was first born at that time. Very vital. They had a sewing club too that they, uh, that they led. They opened a Bible school for the first time from 
the summertime. A lot of activities took place. Uh, United Methodist Men became an organization in the 1950s, along with the same time as, as a youth group for the first time was formed and organized. Uh, the men became known because of Christmas tree sale. Uh, I, could, I can remember the first year that I came here, um, they, they had Christmas trees out on the front of the church lot. Um, and I spent a lot of daytime sitting out in my car um, working on a sermon and selling Christmas tree at the same time. Uh, but we did it and enjoyed it. It was, it was a good experience. And that continues to, to today. I'm Evelyn Lugnowski, and I'm 87 years old. And I have been in the Bethel United Methodist Church and in the area since 1932. I was nine years old when my grandfather uh, moved here from Bailey's Crossroads. I attended, uh, I was nine years old and I attended Bethel School. The old school is long gone. And it went, it was a little two-room school and uh, it, the grades one through four, no, one through six. And after the, after the sixth grade, you went to Occoquan District High School. And it was there at uh, the school that I met a girl by the name of Florence Hedges, who said, Where, what church do you go to? She said, well, why, we have a tiny little church across the way. We'd love to have you come. And so my mom and I went, and we have been a part of Bethel since that very day. We were on a charge, and uh, the pastor would take care of Dumfries Church, Bethel Church, and Akatek, or Silverbrook Church. And uh, the church, churches grew. The first church to withdraw was Dumfries, went on its own. It could support itself. And then the second one was Bethel. And the little church was in the one room, the one room, and it had, uh, was beautifully done. It had uh, uh, about 17 or 18 uh, pews. It would hold about 100 people. And on either side of the church, on either side of the church, was a, a, an, an old wood stove. Every week, somebody would come, one of the men would come, and bring wood and put in the big wood box behind the... Behind the uh, the stove, and uh, that's where we all kept warm. We had to huddle around the stove to kind of keep warm. They were very, very cold, very, very cold, very cold winters. But the they would all the uh, the gentlemen, Mr. Puffenberger, and Mr. George Hedges, and and uh, many, many older people uh, like that uh, would see would come before the congregation got there. They would come and build the fires and get it a little little toasty warm before anybody got there because it was a cold church and it was high ceilings and, and so on, so it took a lot to heat that. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed being a part of a, listening, I guess I should say, to a conversation between Harvey Puffenbarger and George Hedges one day as they were arguing over which one of them came up here most often to stoke the furnaces on Sunday morning. And when they would come, particularly Mr. Hedges, when he would come, he would come through what is now rolling the village, but that was all trees, and he talked about snow on the ground and deers that he walked past, and it was just a fascinating conversation. The homecomings, we would gather together every year, the three, Akatink, Silverbrick, Dumfries, and Bethel. Once every year, we would meet on what was called a homecoming. We had... Um, uh, services in the morning and we would have uh, everybody put their basket dinners together and they would make great great dinner we had great dinners and we would always set up the the dinners on the outside on with the big tables and everything and everybody body brought their baskets and we shared and after dinner there was a hymn sing and then there was um, the churches would get together and tell you of the progress that they have made. I was married. Uh, I was married at Bethel on uh, June the twenty third, nineteen sixty two. And the little church was, uh, I think, it was beautifully decorated, beautifully done. When I came here, I knew that uh, the 
church that we needed to build a new structure. That was a given. And district superintendent so informed me and encouraged me to push that along. Uh, the problem was that the people in the congregation, even though they knew that was had to happen, they weren't excited about it, to say the least. Um, they were attached to this building, they were attached to the community. In fact, I'll tell you exactly what was happening. Because of the development, largely from Dale City at that time, um, the whole area was changing, and changing rapidly. Uh, and people wanted to keep as much of that as they could. So they weren't anxious, to say the least, to uh, to build a new building. They didn't have any choice by the time I got here um, and made the rounds and talked to politicians and people who were influential in the community of their building and structure and the whole thing. I began to realize that they didn't have any choice because the county had already approved the development of Rollingwood Village. And part of the inclusion of that was a connection of Smoketown Road with what was then Davis Ford. To do that, they had to run right through the church's building. So either we did something fairly quickly, or else they could, by eminent domain, take us. We built a new facility. People in the church and in the community wanted to save this structure because of historical value and importance. And so they did so. They raised some $15,000 back in the 1970s to, to pay to move the structure here. But once it was moved, where would we move it? And so Reverend Parrish says, well, let me go and check with the Alexandria District. And so he did. He came back to the Historical Society and said, uh, Alexandria District has given their permission for the Old Bethel Church to be placed on a parcel of land designated by the trustees of the new Bethel United Methodist Church. The Bethel Historical Society was formed and their task was not only to move the structure but also to maintain it and maintenance over the years and they've done a fantastic job of restoration. Plus, as I said before, I think that you know, it, was a, it was a small structure, uh, the condition of the building was not very good and it was on six tenths of an acre and there was no way to do anything there. So the ultimate solution was to build a new building and to relocate, which we, which we did. We have built a, uh, a balcony in here. We did so for engineering purposes. The building was not as secure on the siding as we like. In fact, actually, we've begun to lean a little bit. People in the Historic Society reported to me that there used to be a balcony in the church. Uh, most likely, you entered it from the outside uh, and went upstairs to where a window is now through a small door there. It was a very small balcony, much smaller than the one we have here. That was where the slaves came to worship. So we encouraged, and in fact, I know it happened, that, that some of the leaders of the historic site sat down with people in the Chen family, a local uh, black family, uh, the Chen Library named after them in our community, a very, very vital part of Eastern Prince William County. When I sat down with them and explained the circumstance and wondered if they would be offended if there was a mountain place there just because of the historical connection. And the response that they gave to us is one I really appreciate. They said, build it, please. And every time you get a chance, tell people that that's the way it used to be. And we don't ever want it to be that way again. Bethel has been my life from beginning to, to right now. Mm -hmm. I, I have loved Bethel from the, the time that I uh, was invited. And, uh, and that was the beginning. And it, right now, that is my life, is that old well, the old church. Mm -hmm. The old church I lean toward, but the new yeah. and the old, that, that's my life right now. Uh, she walks down to the house on the corner Where Jesus lives among the least of those who gather there It's a house he started building when he first saw the dust God bless the house that Jesus built, a house he built with love. Cause she walks down to the house on the corner, where Jesus lives among the leaves.